Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to the INCJ International Seminar. And we need just to use this first few minutes to explain what's happening. What you can see in front of you is a roundtable seminar, which is uh, probably going to fill up a little bit more. But out there live on YouTube are about 106 people. Now, I don't know whether this makes any sense to you, but I guess the best way of imagining it, this is that there's 106 people in a lecture theater spread over about 25 countries listening to a seminar. So I just want to say a really big welcome. And I'm hoping that this is going to be a lively, uh, interesting and also useful event. Uh, we're going to use the first couple of minutes leading up to uh, two o'clock European time, just to explain how the event's going to work. Uh, it's the first time we've done this at INCJ, which is to run a live YouTube and a live Zoom at the same time. Now, the reason for that is that we can get a, two things happening. We can record a YouTube and we can record a Zoom from which we can make uh, a podcast and also uh, a YouTube. But it means that you can ask questions if you use the chat facility. And our editor will pass those questions to us. And hopefully we can put that to our expert panel, which is sitting around the round table. So that's the theory. We really hope we can make it work. But I guess as with any live event, uh, things can go wrong. Actually, if it's live, things going wrong probably makes it more interesting. Uh, and my understanding of it is the best thing that can happen is if a child wanders in. I'm rather hoping that my son's dog won't start barking, but maybe if that happens, it'll be more memorable as a result. But as we get closer uh, to the start time, I'm really hoping that this goes well. We think we've got a very interesting program and we hope that you will find it uh, useful for your work or for your studies. And we're getting close to the witching hour. And as we get to one o'clock UK time or two o'clock European time, we'll start then. Thank you very much indeed. Right, my name's John Scott, and I'm here representing the International Network for Criminal Justice, which is based at De Montfort University in Leicester in the United Kingdom. And we're hosting an international virtual seminar today on digitization and human rights in prisons. Uh, if you want to find us on the internet, we're at criminaljusticenetwork.net. And if you want to follow us on Twitter, it's at INT. CJ Network. Now today is the first of six events in our 2021 program, and we brought together a panel of experts and practitioners to discuss how digital tech change in prisons, which has really accelerated during 2020, and where it's going to take us in the coming year. We're going to be looking at the policy and practice challenge that's being faced by criminal justice, both advocates, managers, and policymakers across, ac across Europe and where that's going to take us. We've got presentations today from Rubicon, that's an, an NGO in the Czech Republic, from Stephen van der Steen, who's from France, and Victoria Knight from the United Kingdom. And what's really good is that we've got uh, somebody who's uh, had lived experience as an, uh, someone who served a prison sentence called John Costa and somebody who uh, from the Czech prison service who can give uh, the public sector perspective. Now we've got quite a dense program so my job is to keep things moving and I'm hoping that you'll find it useful. Again we'll get comments from members of the round table but also hopefully give you a chance to send questions and which we will put to the members of the panel. The issues that we want to cover are not just about technology, but some of the ethics and values that are raised about control and security as communication tools are developed in prison settings around the world. And these can have a real impact on prisoners, and staff as the, they understand how to use the digital agenda. 
and there are real practice implications of online interviews, not just for the staff based in prisons, but for families, maybe for victims and for probation staff and for other professionals that have to access people in prisons. Now, if you're interrupted today and can't listen to the whole broad broadcast, as I've said, you'll be able to catch it later if you're called away or homeschooling or something like that intrudes. Well, thank you very much for coming. And we're going to start with an overview of the subject by Victoria Knight, who's uh, an, uh, an associate professor at De Montfort University based in the UK. So I'm going to hand over the floor to you, Victoria. Please take it away. Thank you, John. I'm just going to share a screen. Um, thanks so much, everybody, for attending today. I'm absolutely delighted to uh, see the amount of people that this has attracted. Um, <clears throat> What I want to do is, um, well, John said to me, could you give a global overview of the sort of prevalence of digital technologies in prisons? And I sort of scratched my head and said, I can't possibly do that in five minutes. So what I've done is I've created a, um, a sort of visual taster of some of the things that I've come across um, during my time uh, as a researcher in this on this topic. Um, and as you can see, like in the outside world, there's a variety of technologies appearing in our prisons. Um, and um, it's impossible for me to give an idea of the kind of volume of technologies in our prisons, but there are several things that I do want to say. The first is the digital revolution is happening in our prison services across the globe. Um, uh, and um, and so, um, you know, it, it, it is happening. Um, there are variations, obviously, across the globe, but even within single jurisdictions. Um, I've often described it as a postcode lottery. So if you're a serving prisoner, depending on which prison you go to, will depend on the kind of access to sort of digital services that you may have. This also includes sort of stuff for staff. Um, and um, but what I find interesting as a sociologist is the impact that this technology has on the human end of things. So what is it doing to the people and the structures within prisons? And I've been really lucky enough, I think, at the beginning to sort of enter this field of study right at the beginning of, of di digitization and, and, and that process. So I've just given you a taster there of visuals. And I apologize if I've stolen some of these images from, um, from lovely people that I've met along the way. And you'll recognize, <laughs> I think, your own products. Um, some of you are here today. Um, but um, I think that what I've I've also been lucky to do is to work closely with practitioners to kind of look at and interrogate you know an understanding of the prison digitization program um, and I've worked very closely over the years and and you'll you'll meet Stephen in a minute Stephen van der Steen and and um, he's been really helpful in in uh, in bringing, I suppose, that, that, that practice focus, what that landscape's like and, and how certain decisions are made. And I think one of our most recent publications, and there's a list on our PowerPoint, which we can make available to you guys, is one of our publications, and I think that's the theme of our discussion, around, you know, what happens to the prison environment if we introduce tablets kiosks, laptop setups, electronic mo monitoring. Um, you can see in the center of the screen there a robot guard. Um, what, what's going to happen to the prison and should it disrupt the prison system? Um, should it make it more punitive or should it make it more rehabilitative? Um, and so we, Stephen and I have been reflecting on, on this and we're going to talk more about that in a moment. So I think I'm at the position at the moment that whatever technology is introduced, something as simple as, as an in-cell telephone, for example, can change the way in which people think, behave and feel and respond to the prison environment. So um, in 
terms of a global overview, um, Stephen and I and Bianca Reisdorf are currently doing a global study exploring what we're calling digital maturity. And we're looking at different jurisdictions and, and where they're at on their digital journeys. And so we're in the midst of that study at the moment. And it's revealing some really interesting results in terms of the decision making that those responsible for change and digitization, what are they deciding to implement? it and what the investments like where are they starting what's driving that decision making and what we're finding is that um, the outside world is having an influence on that so how digitized our societies are wherever we are in whatever jurisdictions is influencing those those decisions to move things along in the in in the prison system but we're reporting on that later in 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 the year um so that's a global overview i've kind of bailed out of that a little bit and i want to hand over to stephen now um, and we're going to talk about this paper that we've written and how we're, what we're thinking we've done a lot of work before on on i suppose the 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 the, 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 the again coming back to these decisions that are made by often senior managers in prison organizations and 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 what's driving um uh, the digitization of our prisons and Stephen and I have I think we've been lucky enough to reflect on that and consider what we're calling the ethical principles for what we're calling again digital rehabilitation so Stephen are you there yes I am thank you Victoria okay um, good afternoon everybody uh, I'm really happy uh, that I can speak on this event um, uh, as Vic already introduced, uh, we have been working uh, for a long time already together uh, on the context of uh, digital and prisons, technology in prisons, in corrections uh, in a broader sense. And uh, today we would like to share some of ideas in, in, in the short time frame we have, uh, some ideas and our thinking, uh, uh, what we did recently uh, on, on the ethical principles uh, and a framework of thinking around introducing technology in the correctional setting. So to start this, I would like to just shape a little bit the thinking process, uh, give a short overview on the context and the framework uh, where this digital change, in fact, is taking place. And I would like to uh, point out some, some moral drivers that are, are currently shaping our thinking on this. After this, Victoria will then describe some ethical principles we developed. Uh, we have detected those principles uh, and, and, and we, we believe that they could become pillars of an ethical framework, which could help policymakers, managers, technology designers, private companies, developers, practitioners, so everyone who's involved. And there are a lot of people involved uh, in, in, in this, this uh, let me call it technology related journeys in prisons. Could you move to the next slide? Okay, perfect, thank you. So when starting to reflect on the topic of technology and corrections, um, we were starting to think about, about a more generic standpoint and, and question ourselves, what, what is the thinking process behind using technology in corrections? Is, is it, why should we use technology in corrections? Is it good to use technology? Uh, is it inev inevitable to use technology? Uh, is there a kind of moral obligation around it? And maybe for some, this, this could be a kind of awkward question today if we see how digital our society has come. But when reading through many literature on technology in society or in corrections, many introductions begin with the premise that technology is rapidly changing, a fact that we can hardly deny. But immediately concludes with the consequence that we need to follow this evolution by adapting. My question is the first question, should we? Should we, sh should we just follow that, that change and should we adopt and should we start using technology in corrections, especially in prisons, which is still a specific situation. If we look on technology as such, the first reason we could, we could think about is, 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 is maybe just a pure instrumental one. Um, if we believe technology can help us to improve the way we are doing our jobs, 
I think it's wise to carefully think how technology could help us and continues asking the question if it's helping us achieving our objectives. So the moral driver here of using technology is not technology as, as such, but it's more that we believe technology could help us doing a better job. But if you look a little bit further, I think we, we need to take some more distance about the pure instrumental view of technology and look at the broader picture. And that broader picture is not only looking at technology as a neutral instrument, but acknowledging that uh, technology, as soon as we start implementing or using it somewhere, it's changing the environment. Technology is changing society. So it's much more than, than, than a simple tool, an instrument we use. Uh, it, it, it changes a lot. So the question around this is not as much about technology by itself. It's about that technology that changed society and changed our environment. And so we should turn and need to adapt to that new environment. And based on this, there are more fundamental drivers, moral drivers, we believe, that justify why we should adapt to technology in corrections some way or another. So first, if, if we have the ambition, if we believe that, that, that one of us raison d'etre in prisons is the rehabilitation of offenders, or, or maybe put this in the context of more recent desistant theories, if we want to create an environment where offenders can be motivated and prepared to return to life without crime, this environment should enable the preparation to return in a changing digital society. So we, we need to prepare offenders to return in that, in that new normal. However, again, if, if we don't believe technology could help us doing this, so if, if we believe that we can develop digital skills and we can prepare offenders to, to return to, to society uh, just, just by reading paper books and, 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 and maybe giving PowerPoint presentations about how the internet looks like, we should not give them access to, to the digital. Um, and maybe this is a funny remark, but, but we see that this is a little bit the way what's happening in, in many prisons today. Many prisons, many correction services desperately trying to kind of keep alive or even reanimate analog delivery models of services. Uh, where the outside, those delivery models don't exist any longer. So again, it's not a real obligation to use technology. But it's just like a smart way of doing is using technology to help people prepare for release. So the obligation to prepare offenders for release into a digital society does contain a kind of moral obligation. It doesn't tell us to give inmates a tablet or, or, or let them use the internet. It just tells us we need to find ways to prepare offenders to survive in this techy society. But it doesn't tell us how we could achieve it. Though I'm, I'm strong, strongly convinced also this, this, this still only present conservative attitude is, is, is far from normal. Uh, uh, as a second moral driver, I strongly believe, and we strongly believe that the principle of normality is really important here. It's really relevant in the context of the digital. Uh, I think the, the principle of normality is best known still by how it has been implemented in, in, in for example, the Norwegian correctional system and translated in how the most recent prisons in Norway and, and, and some other countries are designed currently, creating more human environments, using colors and building materials we know outside. I think Halden Prison is very well known and even popular on Netflix and pictures of, of their apartments instead of cells are shared all over the world. But the principle of normality is much more than, 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 than just creating nice looking prisons and jails. Implementing the principle of normality would impl imply clear and transparent arguments for every denial to offenders of any right other than the deprivation of liberty. It clearly states that the life in prison resembles life outside as much as possible. So this brings us much closer to the concept and the topic of today is, is human rights. The question of human rights in the context of the digital access in the prison has already emerged in legal, legal pro, uh, proceedings uh, recently. Legal cases um, about legal cases labor the reality of deprivation for serving prisoners, that they are actively denied access to information and services. 
Cases have been brought to court to determine the communicative rights of serving prisoners and the rights to access information. This is an ongoing debate in many Western countries already, and the European Court of Human Rights already has pronounced that the prison service needs to find solutions. They need to find solutions. It doesn't really say that, that they have, have to give inmates open internet access, but they, they, they need to give them a possibility to access digital content, to give them access to, to, to information that's currently only available anymore digitally, and also to access services like education, for example, a recent, uh, I think, um, court in Turkey uh, uh, obliged the Turkish Ministry of Justice to give an offender access to, to digital educational content. So in this context, it's also important to acknowledge the digital divide that origins from the deprivation to the digital and could be interpreted as a violence on the non-discrimination statement in the Human Rights Declaration. I'm not a legal expert, so, so maybe it's better not to stay a little bit in my comfort zone and, and, and just saying that it is just harmful to deprive people from communication and information technologies. A statement that probably has never been so clear as today during the COVID-19 crisis. And maybe at the end of this quick summary on moral drivers, is it just more and more evident that it's good, useful to introduce and add digital services into prisons? It is more and more proven to be helpful. A lot of fear is related to this topic. There are risks we will not deny. And a lot of technology has been brought into criminal justice, not only for the best reasons. We know that. IT can be a threat for human rights, privacy, dignity. And sometimes, unfortunately, this fear results in a very polarized discussion. Authors are writing about better than human. Is technology better than human? Is, is man better or machine? All those kinds of discussions, I think, is, are ridiculous. It's not or, or, it's and. We have to find balances. Technology has the power to make good things better, but also to make bad things worse. To help corrections avoid the latter, we have to start to develop a framework based on a set of ethical principles. And Victoria will tell you much more about those. Victoria, the floor is yours. Thanks, Stephen. Um, I always enjoy listening to you. Um, I think it's worth sort of saying that how we've arrived at these moral drivers and ethical principles has come about as a result of scholarship, um, research, reviewing, I think, what others have said about the experience of prisons we've drawn and it's took me out of my comfort zone um, in terms of looking at computer ethics um, stuff around um, computer science so it's it's been an interesting journey and so we've not just plucked these out of thin air the, we, this has been years in the making and as Stephen said we we feel that a kind of framework or a set of principles can be useful in helping prisons, particularly senior managers and developers to make informed decisions about how they digitise the prison environment that we all know is fraught of issues of power and exploitation um, and how do then prison how then can technology be exploited to um, enable the humans within them to 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 flourish so taking the moral drivers what we were then able to do was to develop a set of ethical principles. So these are just a guide that we think are, are, are some of the things that, that, that need to be addressed. So if we take the, the, the first one listed here, the legal principles, this relates directly to the moral driver on human rights. So it's ensuring that digitization is, is within the law. I mean, it speaks for itself. Um, and um, Stephen alluded to, you know, issues where, where prisoners brought prison services to, to, to court because they weren't getting access, for example. But also more broadly, and we're seeing 
uh, more and more discussion in relation to analytics and artificial intelligence and you know to what point do we allow the machine the computer to override decision makings when we know serving prisoners and um, released prisoners uh, people that are re-entering society are subject to the scrutiny of the state and all those concerns around artificial intelligence perhaps replacing some of those human processes within that well what is the legal framework have legal frameworks been developed yet so i think ensuring that whatever decisions are made that they are within the sort of remit of of the law or do we need to as hildebrand has said that you know laws now need to be rewritten as a result of you know smart technologies the other one linking to um, 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 human rights is privacy and transparency. And some of you from Europe will be aware of sort of GDPR principles, for example. Um, and, and there's a danger that we know, certainly within the context of the criminal justice system, that there's a lot of data created about individuals. Who owns that data? How much data should be collected um what happens to that data once a prison sentence has been served um you know will that come back to them in some other shape or form for example so this idea of of um um understanding privacy but also transparency if we are going to be using artificial intelligence for example what data is fed into that machine or that program to make those decisions um you know that must have come from human data uh, there's a human being at the end of that and also at the other end of that so these 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 issues around privacy and transparency i think are, are, are linked to those moral debates about human rights um, normality, I think Stephen spoke quite vividly about that. Um, normality is about, for us, and others have said this, about um, positive outcomes by introducing normal um, access to goods and services. For, for example, people being able to make decisions about, you know, how to spend their money, for example, what jobs they can apply for, um, having normal conversations with their friends and family, be it in, them, in their cells or, 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 or elsewhere. Um, we've seen certainly uh, within the context of the, the recent pandemic, you know, acceleration use of video calls, for example, as as as, as opposed to telephone calls, um, certainly within the UK, and I know also in 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 Australia. So um, this idea of of normality, um, but also the impact. There's a great piece of research by McDougall et al. reporting on, you know, as a, as an introduction of kiosks into prisons and reductions in incidents and also uh, re re reduction in recidivism, re recidivism rates as well. So, so there's something about that technology that is a, that is empowering prisoners to, you know to make choices and take control, control of their own lives rather than being subject to a, a, a very paternal model for example. Um, the next one on equality and fairness, um, whenever you read a lot of literature about prisons, um, there's lots of discussion about trust and fairness. And we believe that this can apply to sort of the principles of digitization and reducing um, the limits of or limiting deprivation. Um, and uh, as we've seen, and, and Stephen's alluded to that earlier around the digital divide and digital deprivation and the impact that that is having. I saw on the news this morning, um, you know, it's OK handing out computers to people, but if they can't afford the electricity bill to to power it, for example. So it's a very holistic view. It's not just about the technology. It's not just about the software, but it's it's about enabling um, people to enge engage more, more prolifically on on. On, on that so it, enhancing equality and and fairness is is important 
as I said at the beginning of the presentation, um, you know, um, the digitization of our prisons isn't saturated in technology and um, there are pockets of that and that is growing and swelling and and that's pleasing to see particularly in the light of of covid um but ha you know prisoners don't have a choice where they end up in prison um so one prison may be you know providing a um a, a good digital service but they may well end up in another prison that doesn't so how are uh, you know central services or central jurisdictions responsible for prisons um monitoring that and ensuring equality and fairness across across the board i think i've touched on proportionality and again this is about de depriving um prisoners or not depriving prisoners any more than than what they experience um and again it's about what data should be collected why do we co collect the data that we do what's the use of that data um if we think about certainly what ben crew's written about about forms of soft power and the power that data can have on decision making for for people within the criminal justice system as well and it's it's a bit like can that information come to bite your back a bit like a credit file check um if if any of you are familiar with that with your finances you see how credit worthy you are this data can come back to to to, to, to bite you so i think some 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 deep con um, uh, considerations about data that is collected certainly now we're moving towards online um uh, online platforms so that to me in terms of ethics is about consent are people consenting to something that they want to is there an option to opt out for example um and the final point is about agency, and this links to um, the sort of moral driver of, of, of um, digitization or opportunities to digitize, to be um, restorative, to, to lead towards rehabilitation rather than exacerbate or even eradicate forms of punishment and go towards the sort of rehabilitative. So notions of agency, and I think this is particularly highlighted when we think about education in prisons and where students in prisons can actually access information, for example, doing their own research, is a walled garden, a closed intranet sufficient for people to thrive and be autonomous, for example. So considerations for, for autonomy, I think, come within this notion of, of, of agency. And I'm sure you you guys out there listening today, I'd look forward to your comments on, on, on some of the points that I've made. Just to conclude then, folks, because um, I'm really keen on, on, on discussion, um, is this, this notion of that we what we want as a result of digitization. I think Stephen and I would agree that that um social agents, be them be them prisoners, staff, their families, the wider society, that agency flourishes um, and that people have fair and equal access as much as possible, that data is protected and it's consensual. Um, principles of normality, um, that digital is normal. Um, look at us here today, you know, we're, we're coping with this situation and we're all sat here looking at each other on the screen for now. And I look for, I do look forward to the day to, uh, to mm -hmm. meeting face to face and whether or not it's, it's lawful. We hope that, and this has been a whistle stop tour and our work isn't finished on this and we do welcome we do welcome um your thoughts and ideas um as i said we're working on this global project at the moment around digital maturity i'm thinking of developing some of these ethical principles around notions of desistance and we're hoping to get some funding to do some work on that um, there's lots and lots to say on this, um, really. Um, what we've done on the PowerPoint, there's our details here, and we've listed the articles, I think, that, that have informed, I think, this body of work that we're doing around an ethical framework. 
as well. So thanks so much to NCJ. I look forward to hearing what folks have got to say about what Stephen and I have got to have said. Stephen, have you got anything else to say before we hand back? Oh, I have a lot to say, but I think we have to stick to the time. <laughs> no, thank you very much, Victoria. I, I also would like to hear some feedback from other people. Okay, so I think the uh, that's a cue for uh, the people around the round table to have uh, an opportunity to to comment. So, um, if I say to the live audience out there um, uh, on YouTube, if you'd like to uh, use the chat line to send a question, in, that's great. They will be passed to me as well. But the, in the first instance, let's look to people on the on the round table. Uh, do you want to comment on what you've heard about these drivers and the ethical framework? Because these are really big issues. Um, I have echoes of Big Brother in my head and I'm wondering if you do too. So who would like to start off with a comment? Uh, Francis, you're waving your hand. Say, uh, some, say hello and then get, get, get your comment. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, th sorry, Francis Toy, I'm the founder and CEO of Unilink, who do um, self-service in a few places around the world. Um, and I just wanted to add it briefly to the digital debate. I, I love my job because there's always massive demand for more digital in, in prisons. And that's because the starting point to be frank, is it's a bit of a digital desert. Uh, and so there's huge demand, uh, like for water in a, it, I think about water in Sahara, but more like that. And we're trying our very best to keep up with really what is massive demand for change. And now, and the pace, so just got two points. One is the pace of technology outside is really hard to match within the prison setting. And we're doing our best to deliver some of those things. Uh, but that technology can really deliver education, growth for people, family communication, and um, real help to prisoners who get to learn more. The second thing I want to say, and this to prison authorities, is digitization can help you. It's not just for prisoners, it helps prison officers. It helps prison officers to be more effective. So if you can afford to make the investment in time looking at technology, it will pay off in the long term for you as well. So Thank you and we'll much. carry on doing our best. That's my two points. Excellent. Right, that's got the ball rolling. Who'd like to come next? Uh, is anybody waving their hand to come next? Thank you. Uh, uh, Milan, Moro, Moro, Mareva, would you like to unmute yourself, please? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, Milan. So, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Milan. I'm from the Czech Republic, and I've been working with the Czech Probation Service for 10 years now. And uh, there's a question I'd like to ask uh, related to digitalization in prisons. I think that it was Victoria who in her presentation mentioned that laws need to be rewritten in order to reach a certain level of digitalization, not only throughout the society, but in the prison environment as well. Now, my question is, is there any feedback on uh, the attitude of policymakers in terms of digitalization in prisons? In other words, is there support on the side of policymakers to introduce or to accelerate digitalization through uh, their policymaking? Is, is there any, any feedback on that? Great question. So it's about the appetite for legal reform. So let's start with... Victoria and maybe Stephen. Victoria first. Don't forget to unmute Victoria. Ray. <laughs> Hi again. Um, okay. Um, well, I'll refer to our 
current research on digital maturity. So what we're doing is we ran a global questionnaire and that questionnaire was sent to those responsible for digitisation at a very high level centrally in prison services. Um, and we've got the responses back. And yes, of course, there's, there is appetite, um, but it's interesting what the drivers are. And I think coming back to your point about laws um is is that um there's a bit of it's a bit of a minefield it's 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 what are prison services permitted to do within the law or to do within policy and i think often policy can be quite fixed and i've had lots of conversations with senior colleagues in 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 prison services where they're sort of stuck with this policy and that that what's happening is that digitization means that policy is often has to be redrafted um, so I think what we're seeing is that they're very concerned about managing a particular strategy that's often part of a bigger service strategy and some of that is written is stitched in throughout and some of it's siloed it depends on on the jurisdiction um so um it's 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 it, it is a challenge but i think what i'm saying is is that sometimes um uh, the, the, and this is not a criticism that looking outside at the wider implications of digitization in society sometimes haven't been picked up in those policies so it is about I think paying attention and sometimes joining up work with those outside agencies to sort of inform digital development and digital strategy development. Stephen you have definitely got some points to say here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Um, yeah, I have recently uh, been looking very much into that, that concept of, of legal, legal support for, for digitalization. And then there are two things I would like to share. First of all, you see, and then I think uh, uh, Victoria also a little bit mentioned about that, that in countries where the digital uh, uh, is, is, is high on the agenda of the government, you see that there's much more support and drive to, to enter the digital also into the, uh, the prison. That doesn't mean that digital is very quickly translated in a rehabilitation way of, 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 uh, of, of used uh, for, for offenders, but, but it helps. And, and this is, is especially seen in Asian countries like, like Singapore, like, 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 like Hong Kong and things like that. Uh, another thing that I think that's very relevant and also because I see that Pia is also here on, on, on the call is, is we have a very, I think, unique example in, in Europe where access to the digital and, and, and digital um, participation has been put in legislation, in the penal legislation, in Finland, for example. And that really helps, I think, drive, it gives you an obligation to invest in this because it becomes a legal obligation to, to, to access. But in fact, from a broader European legal perspective, we, in fact, we don't have to do that because a lot of lawyers everywhere, I heard uh, today from a lawyer in France who's doing that, there is a famous politician in Germany, a uh, lawyer who's, 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 who's really working on, 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 on the legal access to the internet and, and made so, so the European prison rules, the, 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 the human rights already give a very, as I mentioned, framework that, that could help. But of course, if you translate it in local, legislation, it helps, and there is a lot of examples already, and it's happening. The last thing I see that the Belgian new Minister of Justice also put this in, in a new governmental uh, agreement, that he really wants to, to, to work on that, give uh, access to, to offenders. The same has happened in the Netherlands. So it's happening everywhere, and, 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 and I hope this, this would help, and maybe link you already to, to, to some other examples in Europe and internationally. Okay, now Rob Canton uh, has raised his hand. So if you could unmute and make your uh, comment or question, Rob. I've got four questions coming in from the YouTube audience, so we'll give them a chance as well. So first, Rob, and then we'll do one or two from YouTube. And then I think Pedro wants to come in. It's pretty lively out there. Okay, Rob first. <laughs> thank you, John. Very much appreciated. Hello, everyone. Uh, good to see you all. And thank you very much to Victoria and Stephen for fascinating introductions to this topic. Um, great for me to see you beginning with ethics or putting ethics straight in, because so often the criminal justice system 
proceeds with something and says, oh, does it work? And is it any good? And then thinks, oh, yes. And there's the ethics considerations. But you've put that in from the very start. So three cheers for that. And thank you. And I think that the starting point with human rights is, is fundamental because this is not just about facilitating um, rehabilitation or even supporting desistance. It's fundamentally about making sure that uh, people who are serving prison sentences have access to digital inclusion, have the same opportunities, that so they are not further excluded from the world in which most other people uh, live. And then my final point is just to ask whether anybody knows whether the Council of Europe prison rules has anything to say on this topic, because if this is to go beyond um, an academic community of people who are already thinking along similar lines, it would be good if someone could at some point make representation to the Council of Europe and say, this is something that needs a recommendation, either a discrete one, or it needs some kind of emphasis in existing recommendations on either on prisons or community sanctions or measures or both because that way is the beginning towards a soft law and to making sure that legislation begins to reflect the, the modern world in which we live. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rob. So uh, I'll try and get uh, two or three of the uh, outside questions in now. Uh, one from uh, someone called A. Sartorio. Thank you very much. It's a question for Victoria. Is there a current pilot project in the works to test or serve as a case study to implement some of the initiatives that you discussed? Um, thank you um, for that question. Um, that's an interesting question, and, and um, you've reminded me we've omitted um, in our presentation the sort of paucity of um, research evidence. Um, there have been a small handful of, um, should I say, evaluations of technologies. Uh, more recently in uh, England and Wales, there was a uh, an evaluation of in-cell telephony. Um, um, and, and there's been, and I mentioned the McDougal study, which, which, which which looked at some of those interesting outcomes that certainly prison services would be motivated to look at. Um, there's there's several challenges with research in this area. Um, as a researcher, and I don't want to get too technical about research methodologies, but because the pockets of, um, I suppose, research are relatively small, the kind of evidence base that services are often after isn't big enough to satisfy that 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 need to say, well, does it work? What works? What works? Um, the other issue is that they're quite geographically dispersed, so um, that that presents challenges. And mm. um, often that they are very small pilots um, that last for a, a small amount of time. This is I'm talking historically here, but as we're seeing things grow, I think there's now now is the time that we should be doing more of that kind of research. However, us researchers firstly need access. We need funding <laughs> to do the research. Um, and there needs to be a commitment and a partnership between, you know, academics, developers, prison services, that kind of thing. So it's been an interesting journey. And from my point of view, I'm interested in the human condition. And um, for, for, for you senior managers that are listening out there, I'm, le I'm less concerned about, you know, KPIs. I'm more interested in what it's doing to the human and how much it's leading towards, you know, those softer things that we can't necessarily measure. So things like desistance rather than re rehabilitation. Okay. Um, Yes. I'm, I'm going to pause you there because we've got we're running out of time a bit yes. for this section. Pedro wanted to come in, and then I've got another question from uh, from YouTube. Pedro, well, hello, hello, good morning to you all. Um, picking uh, uh, on both on what um, um, Francis uh, started to mention and and Stephen uh, later on. Well, the 
Uh, I fully agree that that has been in, in many countries. This this has been quite a, a desert field in terms of digitization. Uh, certainly, it it has been, and um, and and technology has been bringing uh, access to or allowing the access to to basic rights of individuals, uh, being in terms of communications, as, as Victoria just mentioned, uh, visitation, health, learning. Uh, access to ac other services that relate, for instance, with employment support or access to, to justice with, with virtual court hearings that we've been um, um, uh, uh, seeing uh, uh, increased uh, all, all over, all over, all over um, the world. Um, when we bring these services, uh, and as, as it was mentioned as well, um, we see the, the, the huge potential for acquiring data about individuals, about their behaviors, about um, uh, the way they, the way they, uh, they, they live, the, the choices they, they make, uh, the, the persons they relate to. Um, and I just wanted to make the point about the, the legislation issue that you, that you previously mentioned. So at the European level, that has been a big concern about, about this. So um, how, um, to what extent can these data be used? To what extent can these data be uh, used for other purposes, can be analyzed and can be used to predict future behavior, for instance, in many cases. So the, the Council of Europe uh, uh, at the end of, the, of, the, of, the, of um, uh, 2019 issued an, an a European ethical charter on the use of artificial intelligence in judicial systems, which was quite a, a bold move, I must say, um, which, which somehow, uh, we, we're talking about, um, uh, it's, it's a recommendation, of course, but it's, it was approved by the, by the Council of, of, of Ministers at the, at the Council of Europe. So it's, it's important enough because it brings already recommendations about respect of fundamental rights, about the principle of non-discrimination, quality and security, transparency, uh, user under control, and so on. So there, there, there are a lot. There, there are recommendations, and, and, and the principles are, are very important. And lately, we've seen as well the European Commission publishing uh, the, both the, the, the European Parliament. Um, um, this year adopting a resolution uh, about the use of artificial intelligence and how it's, uh, it, it's being used in the, in, the, in, the, in the criminal justice sector or the European Commission publishing uh, uh, guidelines for, for member states as well uh, 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 on that regard. So um, I know this, uh, at least the ones, the last ones about the European Commission and, and the Parliament are a bit, um, uh, we, we will not affect the UK at least, but uh, the one from the Council of Europe uh, uh, or the recommendation is, is certainly valuable. So, but the point I want to make is that even though the national leg legislations may not uh, refer specifically uh, to this at European level and, and at these uh, multi um, uh, higher instances, uh, let's say that influence national legislation, there is already work being done that somehow um, uh, 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 influences the, 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 the legislation at national level. Uh, of course, at the level of the European Commission, we've, we've seen what, what has been the impact of the GDPR as well and, and, and other, uh, and other um, uh, directives and, and regulations. So this is just to say that, yes, there is a lot already being produced that will have an impact uh, on national legislations that will affect the way we use digital technologies in prison. Okay, wow. Pedro. Thank you. Thank, thank you for that. Um, one last um, point coming from our audience, if I may. This is from uh, a guy called Yiri Myrtle. Thanks very much, Yiri. Um, so it's to Stephen. You mentioned some positive examples of technology implementation, Norway, etc. Can you elaborate more examples, please? Because in Czech prisons, even Skype calls are sometimes a big problem. So just let's end with some positive examples and then we'll move on with our agenda. Yes, okay, so positive examples. I think there's a lot of things coming on in education for prisons. I think uh, Sweden was one of the pioneers in, in using a, a Citrix-based uh, system to, to, to support remote education. I think Denmark was one of the pioneers in access uh, giving amidst access in specific areas in libraries, access to the internet. 
Norway, exactly, they are, they are really going into an, an, an enormous digital uh, uh, stream, uh, modernizing the, the entire digital infrastructure. What's very important in Norway is to see how, how this is part of, of the model and the integrate or the entire staff. We already heard someone say, don't forget about the staff. The staff integrated in supporting that, 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 that approaches towards individualized uh, uh, access to, 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 to services. So that, that's a very good thing. I think Pia Pupoloko is here the project leader of, of the Digital Prison Project in Finland. They also uh, delivered a journey for, for, for uh, giving inmates access to the digital. I, when I was CIO in Belgium, we, we started the prison cloud system in the prison of Beveren, which, which was implementing a platform to, to, to enable the, the delivery of different di digital services. What kind of digital services? Of course, educational, uh, controlled access to the internet, but also communication, also access to legal files. I know there is, there is a project on, uh, going on in the UK to give inmates access to, 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 to the legal files, mainly focused mm -hmm. on pretrial detention. I, I can go, go on and go on, so, so please reach out to me and I can share a lot. And this is only Europe, and I, I, I would be able to tell you a lot of, of, of other... other uh, Quite often, prison authorities are influenced about good examples from other jurisdictions. So let's get those in the public domain. Now, Look how lively that was. I want to also remind everybody that if you want to carry on a conversation... Apparently, lots is happening on Twitter as well at the moment. So if you want to go to at INTCJ Network, uh, uh, I cannot multitask. I'm a mere male, so I'm concentrating on what's happening here. But out there in the Twitter sphere, apparently, there's a conversation going on. Feel free, those of you that can operate on different levels, to do that. So we're going to go uh, off from the, that discussion. Thank you for it. And also for Stephen and Victoria for starting us off so well. We're going to change pace a little bit now. And uh, our next agenda item is in the programme is to look at what's called lived experience. And we're going to look at uh, the service user perspective. And we've asked John Costa, who's got a, um, a rather unique take on uh, what it's like to think about uh, being in prison uh, because he's served a sentence himself. But John uh, has a career now as a journalist, an educator, and what he calls a documentarian. So I'm just going to pass over to John and uh, give the floor to him. Thank you, John. This is John saying thank you to John for handing over to John. Yeah, thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my colleague Rob Watson has informed me there's 45 people watching on YouTube as well. So that's good, as well as the people that are here. Um, and hopefully this is of interest to you. Uh, as I, I'm a journalist now, freelance journalist, and I teach part time um, media production at uh, De Montfort University with Victoria Knight, who recommended me for this as well. And obviously with Rob, Rob Watson. Um, I spent uh, three months in prison. 13 years ago so I, I often call that sort of two parts of my life but also pre the internet uh, for most people and smartphone technology and the things that we're talking about now so probably have quite an interesting view on it and the talks that I give about that uh, particularly to students going forward um, now obviously I'm here as lived experience because I've sort of s seen it from the inside but I guess the pandemic has done something quite strange for all of us and for the world as well, which has given us all an opportunity to understand what isolation is like, maybe not being able to go out, the logical side of going out for a walk, that sort of stuff. But the one thing that's probably helped all of us during this period of time is we're still able to communicate with people. So my view has always been, and uh, when I got asked to give this talk, was very much around that kind of communication with, with family members, particularly children, you know, your, your own children. Um, Victoria gave me four things that she wanted to, for me to focus on because she knew I only had 10 minutes and I could talk for four hours. So I'll, I'll just answer those four points, if you like, and then hopefully I'm willing to expand on any of them when we have the conversation. Um, it says here in your experience, what was prison like with limited access to, to communication? It was the isolation from family, children, family, connections, that kind of stuff. And what I observed in there, because um, obviously from my own perspective I'd never been in trouble before I think I was must, I think was 41 at the time um, you know lots of younger people lots of people in there where it was a sabbatical from their chosen career um, was that it raises anxiety amongst prisoners as well through to not what's going on at home 
through to you know worrying about situations and also that you know they were more than capable of carrying on their own business in there as well while they were away so i think you know we need to be considerate of that when it comes to access to digital technology and stuff about you know both the victim but also people carrying on as normal and not not changing behaviors maybe um there's lots of tension points as well um i think you know phone cues we tend to focus on phone cues in popular culture now in netflix and and anything that you'd see about um that kind of stuff tension points where you can meet other people um, for things to kick off so i think anything for example if i look back now the ability to have called from my cell um i think would have been uh, would have been a positive one um and you know not having to go out and maybe having people here in your conversation while you're in the queue um and again also being able to get to the phone at all i remember when we first went in you know the way that the the, the, the floor was unlocked meant that you were never in the queue at, at, at the beginning you know or or the shower so th those kind of things yeah so that's you know for me it's it's very much around communication to, to first and foremost then the next point was what role should digital services and devices have for prisoners well for me i think it would have been helpful with things like canteen and the ordering of personal items um and also being able to have some sort of control over that that you couldn't be influenced i remember a prison officer saying to me on the very first day you know if you don't smoke don't start you're not in the you're not in the trade you're not in the currency um to be able to be influenced or coerced in, in any way shape or form so there was for me it's that kind of ease to be able to do that maybe access to money for things that you want particularly if you're serving a longer sentence you know um it was on a catalog it could be done easier communications with family I, i was very lucky to get a job in the library they were like ha he's a journalist he can probably read and write we'll get him in the library he'll be great for ordering magazines um was use of things like storybook dads you know the use of sort of obviously that was very cd based then anything that we were giving people positive experiences where they could use maybe something they the last time anyone said anything positive to them was at school about their artwork they were able to do the artwork for the cd that went back to their child with their own voice so we were teaching skills to people that for the first time it was about the outside world you know um education um because of the shortness of my sentence it became quite clear talking to some of the longer prisoners that you know you couldn't access things unless you were in there for a longer term so all the jobs were taken i ended up helping people to read and write that were from foreign countries um and then took part in some education as well but that was very much based on laptops so therefore we had trouble with those that couldn't use that technology because they hadn't engaged in a positive way with school um and of course then there was the, the necessary reading and writing if you then made it about pen and paper so i think anything where people going in now to prison where they could access education or things that would be useful to them based on the technology that they they were using now would help them when they were inside rather than regressing back to something that was almost like backward looking if you want um probably would make the prison sentence even even worse um If you've not had a good experience with school then education in prison you know it's a very much it's a good one or it's or it's, a, it's it's a negative one so I think if you were using things that were going to be meaningful and genuine for employment next steps particularly if we're looking for people to stop and to change their lifestyles I think having something that's not just a time filler that would be very very positive yeah um and I remember you know going into the education thing where it was MS and Carter So of course in a closed system you were putting the CDs in to access information so I think anyone who is looking to better themselves and change then you know it needs to be done on that basis just an interesting point when I came out of prison and started a a um news agency around uh, the criminal justice system it was called inside and out so we used to take ex uh, ex offenders and give them employment opportunities um so they for their first reference we actually got the library service to use the system they'd put in place to catch people using the internet bear in mind this was 2000 and um, 2009 uh, 2008 2009 to actually monitor that person's time slot that they were on there using the internet so it can be done sometimes the system that's used there for catch for catching people can actually be used to monitor people and give them enough rope in order to be able to move forward okay um the third one was do prisoners have a right to access technology in prison 
I might be controversial here and say, well, no, you know what I mean? I think, you know, as, as someone who's, who's been inside, maybe, you know, maybe I didn't have any rights at all. You know, I'd, I'd committed an offence and there I was. Um, everybody's, every, everyone in prison is innocent. It's interesting when you stand in, in queues with people, everyone will tell you that they didn't do that. It was someone else. And so I think, you know, it's an interesting to hear you guys talk about human rights and stuff. But at some point, those rights come with responsibilities. And so, you know, is it, is it punishment? Are you away from family? Is that punishment enough? Should you be able to access all the things that you've got at home, like, you know, digital streaming services and stuff? So now I talked to students for the last eight years of the 13 years I've been out at Loughborough University. And those students are always going off to be um, social workers, working child protection, police officers, prison officers. And we often have this conversation. And I said, sometimes I think we need to look at it logically about what the sentence is when it comes to access to this stuff, but also things like in relation to the outside world, if someone now has just served a 13 year prison sentence and goes out, they don't know what a smartphone is. You know, we need to think about how long that technology has been around. But also if you're about to go in today and that kind of technology isn't there, maybe it's worse because it's going back to something that they've, ne they've never used before, which might, you know, pen and paper, for example. Yeah. So I think it's positive in being able to use technology. And I think it's really important, but I would say that in anyone that I've spoke to that's involved in the criminal justice system, even to the, the chief constable locally coming to me and say, John, could you come and talk to some of my officers about what your experience was like? Because you can actually tell it in a way they understand. Um, it's always been about, the media response. I think people that are in the criminal justice system, you know, senior managers and stuff would always be aware of, you know, what's the response in the media. I remember when they were talking about prison radio here and the sun was used a, a headline of something like lazy lags listening to radio all day doing nothing. It's what the messaging is that you're using and what the message is that you're putting through. And then the final point was what responsibility do prison services have in the administration of digital technology? Um, I think the responsibility is making sure the equipment is um, is relevant, modern, and it actually works uh, for anybody that's leaving prison today, you know, particularly if you're going to get it into talking about employment. Um, and also that it's, it, it, it's safe and there's no fear of the continuation of crime from victims, thinking of people going inside, being able to maybe, you know, perpetuate. Uh, intimidation through the fact that they've got open access you know it's the fact that you know we're, we're able to monitor everything that we do now amongst ourselves on the outside world why can't we monitor that inside um, and maybe link it to things like um you know privileges access as as everything else is so for me i think it's definitely communication being able to communicate with the outside world and to close the loop on where i started if you look at the pandemic now like i said you've all experienced the period of isolation and sort of you know not being able to do what you necessarily want but the one thing that's helped us is being able to communicate with people you know use use technology like this to carry on functioning i think it's the logic of putting that into that kind of environment is the thing that's going to be the most positive one to focus on thank you John, thanks very much indeed. Um, we've got quite a lot of comments coming in. So let's go straight to some of the outside comments. Um, uh, someone called Franz Lemmers has made two um, comments relating to how important e-learning and education is for people uh, inside prisons. Um, and let's see if we... John, I can put you straight into that education aspect of digitization and whether you've got any comments that you'd like to raise about that. Um, France uh, is saying what needs to be done so that inmates can follow study courses that they want to, perhaps choosing their own perspectives. Can you pick up that point? Absolutely. The first example I'll give you was um, engaging in level one and two English uh, even if you were able to pass that, but you couldn't pass it because it was being done on a laptop and not with pen and paper, that you then couldn't access creative writing, which would have really helped you because that was level three. Mm -hmm. And you had to do one and two for the funding. And I remember having some you know, very kind of mature, level-headed conversations. Hopefully it comes across I'm a mature and level-headed person. I can have a conversation even if I'm a prisoner and you're a prison officer or someone working in education about the logic of stuff. And they, they shared the frustration that, a lot of people they couldn't help through creative writing 
they couldn't because of level one and two having to be the benchmark for you to do to get there. Okay, so for me, I think education is key because invariably, you know, someone like myself, you know, I'd like to think I was an anomaly in there and, and all of the experiences I had and conversations and even still being able to communicate with a lady that run the library 13 years later meant that I came with that kind of um, way of being able to represent people. But if you come into prison with a poor experience of education or, or little in, uh, experience of education and you treat the prison system as an extension of the criminal justice system, like you would talk to the police or anything mm. like that, prison officers, then your experience is going to be that self-perpetuating thing where you're never going to spin out of it. And of course, you get employment inside which you then use for your canteen but that's not getting you to look at what comes next and i think that's where education is key being able to access things that people are interested in because if they're interested in it then obviously they're going to be able to um focus motivate and achieve that now if we look at it from the perspective of maybe now in the pandemic where people are home educating you know you're you're, tr you're struggling getting your child to do classes like they did at school but if you were to set up a project now and set out to do a project that brought into account, you know, history, geography, maths, English and all that sort of stuff, they'll be writing and doing math calculations by making a, a newspaper more than they would if you did maths, English and all that. Sort of. So I think there really needs to be a logical uh, view of this as well that also aids, you know, prisoner calmness, um, you know, compliance. Things are a lot calmer. Um, you know, it, uh, dare I say a happy prison. I didn't mean it in, in, in such that term, but certainly helping prisoners to think about what comes next and that responsibility and the impact on family and stuff, you know, sort of desisting in that behavior and, you know, rehabilitation sometimes comes from within as much as it does about being punished and stuff. So got, hopefully got, that's helpful. Yeah. yeah, no, good. And I've got one more, more comment from the uh, YouTube audience and I want to start with you, John, and then we'll broaden it to the panel. Do any of the panel know of any initiatives focusing on communication with families' needs of prisoners imprisoned away from their home countries? But let's, let's ask your lived experience. You spoke about how cut off and isolated you felt. Can we start with you, John, sure. about whether you know, the digital agenda could help you with that? And then maybe let's ask the wider panel about contacts with people who's, who are in prison away from their own country. Let's start with you, John, and then we'll broaden the question. Sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, the, 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 the ex-wife, um, she was the wife at the time, said, like, you know, you know, I'm not bringing the kids to see you. So for the whole time I was in there, I only saw um, my parents a few times and some, some other mates came to visit. So... I think, you know, it was my kids only, I only engaged with them through stuff they sent me or I sent them when they went to my parents. Okay. So there was no communication at all. I think if there'd been the ability to beyond use of in free time, queuing up for the phone, I probably could have done a face-to-face -face video call with them at least once when they'd been at my parents. And that would have been quite helpful for me and them. I mean, they were seven and eight at the time. Uh, that would have been um, quite helpful for them. And I think also the only experience I've got of talking to, to people is I remember this lady came to me once and said, I'd seen a, a, a talk you did on YouTube about being in prison. She said, and my ch can, I wonder if you can help me. So my children get really upset at mealtime thinking about their dads eating in prison at the same time as them. And I said to her, well, when do you have dinner? She said about half five. I said, well, he's eaten an hour earlier. Dinner in prison was at half four. And she said, really? I said, yeah. So you can just say to your kids, well, you know, Dad's off doing something. He's in the exercise yard or he's, he's in the library or he's in the gym, you know. And she said that completely changed the dynamic for her of tea time with her children because they didn't feel like this man was sitting in a parallel universe exactly the same time as them. And I think because popular culture is what feeds our relationship or understanding of prison from, you know, Essex Boys through to Danny Dyer through to everything that's on Netflix – that kind of state penitentiary example, somewhere in between there, I always say there was this metronome between, you know, the Shawshank Redemption and Porridge. And for you that don't know what Porridge is, it was a comedy that we had that used to be set in prisons here. You know, hours of calm and with moments of, of, of madness, I think we don't understand what, prisons life, what prison life is like. Everything that most people know beyond maybe people on this call or on YouTube know about prison, they get from popular culture. 
And obviously that just, you know, magnifies the bits that are much more interesting or violent or, you know, more humorous. Let's let's just broaden it then. Um, can we look to other people on the panel to look at the question of communication with families and are there examples about reaching out uh, to families if their relative is in a prison in another country? Are there good examples of being able to have digital contacts? Anybody able to pick that up? I'm looking around. Okay. Can I uh, just respond to that? Thank you, Steve. Uh, yeah. C- communication, let me first start with voice communication. I think uh, telephony, a lot of the majority of the cont- uh, countries uh, allow communication by voice, but often it's very expensive. That's already a problem. A second problem I o- uh, also see is that the time zones and things like that is not taken in account. And it fits in what, 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 we just, what we just heard is also about what John says is the link to the outside uh, and the moment when you're allowed to call uh, is not always uh, the best moment for, call, for calling a family who is busy with, with feeding the kids, for example. So a good example is what I think that the current project that, that has almost completely rolled out in Belgium is telephony on the cell and giving people the, the much more room and, and time-wise to, 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 to call when, when, when they are suitable and when it fits, fits also the, the other person uh, for calling. It's a project that's also rolled, uh, it's rolled, currently rolling out in France. But of course, video is, 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 is even an added value, uh, very important uh, related to that. And I think, and, and maybe it can be one of, one of the single uh, 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 collateral uh, positive things related to COVID is that all the countries where, where, where they have uh, introduced video conferencing technology uh, uh, see that suddenly also those people who would never have a visit because they're their family and relatives live the other side of the world now have the possibility to do that. Although I hear that a lot of logistic and passport and identity controls is blocking it often, but I think video confer- conferencing and, 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 and visual visit technology is very powerful to, to support that. Mm. And also cheap. So... Um... Can I interject? We talked about money, the dirty word money. <laughs> Can I just come in? Is that all right, John? Go, go for it, Victoria. Yeah. Um, yeah, this sort of phraseology around video conferencing and video visits, um, which I know it's used quite heavily, that term, in the US. Um, and I was rightly corrected on Twitter, I think rightly corrected, that they're not visits, they're calls. Um, and there's been quite a lengthy debate and some tension around the use of video calls, um, certainly in the US, where, you know, uh, families are charged $25 a hit. And, you know, the, the call quality um, and, and they're relatively short. And, and, and so there are some tensions around who's willing to pay for digital engagement, be it video calls. And, and so there's, there, there is there are some tensions around the costing of services for prisoners, um, which I don't think we've touched upon today. Um, but in terms of, you know, exploiting, you know, often poor poor families, um, uh, you know, $25 is a lot cheaper than, you know, taking a day off work, traveling for you know if we think about the geography of 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 america and traveling to the nearest prison that their family might be in um you know that 25 dollars is an attractive option but does that replace the quality of um of a of a face-to-face visit so you know there are some tensions around that um I've, uh, there's been some anecdotal evidence that that I've I've heard of is certainly you know how how welcomed families have have received these video calls particularly with the onset of 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 the pandemic and how useful they've been um, but um, I've heard and again this is anecdotal that. It, it, this has been upsetting, you know, children and also prisoners, you know, to see their family environment as well when they've been removed from it. So there's lots of tensions and it's it's complex. 
weeks. Um, but I think, you know, the in-cell telephony is, is a good step in the right direction. And again, there are pockets of this happening um, acro acro across the globe. And, and again, we need to just observe and watch, you know, this is all unknowns for, for, for the prison settings. Okay, now we are going to need to move on. Um, John Costa, do you just want to have a last word before we move on to the next topic? Last word, good grief. Um, yeah, it's a societal thing as well. You know, we've got to take people on a journey of maybe understanding what the criminal justice system is, what the purpose of the criminal justice system is, you know, what restorative justice is, all that kind of stuff, maybe what the options are. Um, and, uh, you know, I think the example of drop the box is a really good thing that we have here in the UK where they're trying to get um, employers to drop the box that says I've got a criminal record. Um, now, I understand that, you know, you might not necessarily want to employ uh, an ex-offender. That's fine. But at the same time, you know, here we've got people that can't get work because of their uh, uh, criminal, criminal record that could work. This is the thing. It's not a case of not wanting to work. It's the fact they could work and therefore, you know, there'd be less drain on the state when that cycle thing is they're a drain on the state because they've got a criminal record. I think, you know, the work that I've done with young women particularly that have got criminal records around the fact that, you know, they've stolen the condoms to give to their abuser um, or, you know, stealing baby food and, and all the situations we've got around food banks and stuff that, you know, people are getting criminal justice records now, are getting records now that, you know, were on their way and destined in a parallel universe to attend university and are now caught up in that cycle. And so I think we look to the criminal justice system for solutions to these things within the wall. Yeah, and of course, then the, when the dirty thing, as Victoria said, money comes into it, there isn't money for doing that. So do you lock people up more often or do you give them chances to re rehabilitate or turn away from it? And then they come out into a world that is still not interested in them, even when they've rehabilitated, unless they're the poster child of they've got their open university degree and therefore they're going to work for a charity. That doesn't happen to the vast majority of people that come out that want to change their lives. Mm. It's my final okay. word. And it shall be noted. Thank you. Now, again, we're going to ch change direction a little bit, and we're going to uh, take an NGO perspective and uh, in invite uh, Jana Kavkova, who works for Rubicon, which is an NGO in the Czech Republic. Her job title is advocacy expert. And Jana, I'm going to ask you to take the next part of the programme, please. Thank you, John. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Um, my name is Jana, as uh, John said, and what I would like to share with you is the perspective and experience of NGO uh, when working with our clients in prisons. And I will I have gathered some direct experience from my colleague, not only from Rubicon, uh, but I'm also active in an association like an umbrella uh, of NGOs working in penal affairs. So I rely on uh, the experience from the ground from my colleagues who provide mainly counseling or some educational services in Czech prisons. And um, definitely what I have to say, uh, thanks to the COVID pandemic, there has been a huge change in, in our prisons. Uh, maybe you could almost call it a revolutionary change because our experience is usually things are changing rather slowly within uh, the prisons uh, because they're pretty rigid institutions. But I have to say that during the COVID pandemic, uh, a, lot, uh, a lot of things have taken place. And if I think about it, actually the prisons and the prison service uh, were able to adapt pretty quickly, because I think Czech Republic is not very far um, in terms of digitization. Uh, I think we really lack behind other European countries. And uh, I would say the change that happened uh, in, in Czech prisons was quite big. So what happened is that part uh, of our work, which we always used to do in person, uh, has moved to the online world. So we provide online uh, counseling or other services to our clients uh, in prisons. And while before the pandemic, it was impossible to have a Skype conversation with, with a client, with a prisoner. Now, more than half of the prisons where we are working 
actually enable uh, Skype conversations with, with our clients. So there has been a big, uh, big uh, change in there. And I also have to admit that, that this has been, it still is a learning process for all the parties involved, for uh, the NGOs, for the prison service employees, but also for, for, for our clients, for the prisoners. We all somehow got to used to this new situation. And I also understood that not our councils were very happy about this move in the beginning, that they have to you know, stop their direct work with the clients and instead communicate uh, by Skype. So we all had to find our ways how to, how to adopt the new situation. And still, there's a lot that needs to be figured out. Uh, there are definitely many challenges, mainly because the situation is very different in particular prisons. So definitely what we would need, but I'm sure it's been worked on, is to have kind of rules and standards uh, and support for all the prisons that the conditions are getting more similar in all the prisons. Uh, but I understand that this is, this is a journey. Um, definitely, uh, there are a lot of uh, pluses or benefits uh, in the online communication. Uh, number one is definitely uh, efficiency, right? Czech prisons mostly are pretty remote. So to travel, to, to get in touch with your clients takes a lot of time. So uh, it's fine that this is, this is much faster, much easier. And it also enables us, enables us to be in touch more often just to check up on our clients uh, and not to wait till the next visit or exchange letters, which we, which we did before. Um, what we find is also very useful uh, that sometimes we can also share documents, for example, when we are helping with the debt issues or uh, helping to prepare the people for release, then we can share some of the documents uh, during our conversation, share the screen. And again, this makes uh, things much faster. But now, then again, some prisons actually allow to share screen when you, when you, when you are having a con conversation. Other prisons don't allow to, to share the screen. So again, the standards are very uh, different in different prisons. Uh, a practice that we also use is using these online meetings when uh, one uh, counselor working with a client in the prison needs to transfer the client to a, to a new counselor, for example, a person who will be helping this client after release, which was not possible, you know, having them all traveled to uh, to certain prison. So now, now this is possible, this transfer meetings. Uh, but there are also a lot of problems and challenges. Definitely, I would say number one is um, privacy, because uh, no uh, prison actually allows the Skype calls without a presence of somebody from the uh, prison staff. And sometimes there's even other people, other inmates uh, that are actually Skyping in the same room. So there's a lot of lack of privacy and you cannot discuss any personal matters uh, because the environment is just not, not uh, safe enough. Um, for us, it's sometimes also difficult even to assess whether the situation is even safe, whether there are, who is actually there in the room, you can't see it on Skype. So you talk to your clients, but you don't, you don't really know who else is in the room. Uh, so this is, this is also quite, quite difficult, quite challenging. Um, there's an interesting point that one of my colleagues actually mentioned that uh, he was working for home, from home and he had this conversation with a client in prison and that actually this was very unpleasant for him that he had the feeling that he kind of invited uh, uh, the client into his home and it, he, he felt this, this was unpleasant as well. Of course, you can solve it by using some, you know, some environment that you set uh, on your computer, but it was an interesting concern about privacy also from, from, from our colleagues, from our counselors. Um, definitely, I would like to stress out that 
the online uh, communication can never replace the the personal uh, contact that we have with our clients. But I do think that uh, it's very wise to use a kind of combination that you might uh, have personal contact and personal uh, visits, but also keep the online um, contact even after uh, the end of the pandemic, that it's some uh, something we should uh, we should keep and uh, develop it even further after the pandemic, hopefully, <laughs> is over one day. And, you know, when we will actually be able to, to visit our clients in prisons again. Um, and I'm also happy to say that uh, as NGOs and as the asso association uh, of the NGOs, recently we've been in quite intense contact with the Czech prison service and we're thinking and discussing how we could uh, develop the online communications further, not only between uh, NGOs and their clients, but maybe also that NGOs might help the family members who don't have access to internet uh, to actually visit their, their families uh, in prisons. So that's something we're still discussing, which might be a next exciting step. We're just talking about it as a pilot project now. Uh, so I don't know if I still have time or if you are going to stop me there, John. One more minute. One more minute. Um, okay, uh, maybe in one more minute, what I would like to highlight are four considerations, which are not my own. I, I've read them in a very interesting uh, toolkit on virtual justice put together by uh, Incarceration Nations Network. And the first of them is, uh, let's seize the opportunity, opportunity to reform. So the pandemic definitely is an opportunity. We should make use of it. The second one, don't overestimate the transformative power of technologies. Technologies still are just a tool. And I definitely think we need to reform the current criminal justice, justice system to, to make it more uh, restorative. And technology might be a useful tool, but it's just a tool. Uh, third one, don't underestimate the digital divide. I mean, there's huge differences between, you know, the access people have to, to internet, et cetera. And fourth one is don't underestimate the costs and also the implementation challenges. So to digitize prisons is a process that will cost some money. It will be a difficult task, but I definitely think it's important and we should take this step and uh, continue in transforming the prisons and making them resembling the outside world uh, also in the digital terms. Thank you. Uh Fantastic. What great use of a minute that you use. Thank you very much indeed. Um, the, um, our, our audience has been pretty active and I'd just like to uh, feed in a couple of points. And then Pedro has his hand raised. So we'll go straight to Pedro after I just feed in these points from outside. Is that OK? Um, two people uh, want to um, agree with the, the issue that you shouldn't monetize uh, aspects of contact with prisoners. Um, so um, uh, admin charges for fund deposited into inmate accounts or uh, having to pay for video contacts, um, particularly when, for example, WhatsApp and so many uh, access points to video calls are free. Um, uh, uh, somebody called uh, Balatito Akinralabu said uh, video calls are cut off if families receive them whilst outside their homes. This is understandably a security precaution, but how do we balance security and rights or prioritize one over the other? I mean, that's a, uh, a profound point, um, but again, uh, shows how a video call can have complex implications. Um, and um, there's a, another uh, point just come in, which says, uh, in your views, what are the three main initiatives that you envisions, envision to help capitalize on the momentum COVID has given us for improving prison systems? Um, I noticed that in the uh, presentation we just had from uh, Jana, 
there are uh, really interesting NGO potential to improve the work between the NGO sector and the prison service and how uh, the NGOs can help work with families, for example. Well, as we broaden the discussion out from the round table, perhaps you could bear that uh, last question uh, in mind as we look to the future. So Pedro had, had his hand up, so let's see what he would like to contribute. Yes, very, very, very briefly. It's, it was just, uh, um, uh, I raised my hand when, when Victoria was, was talking about the situation in the US and we, we should distinguish very well uh, the reality in the US and the reality you know, uh, in Europe and, and uh, in our own context, both in terms of the pricing and the model and, and the way it works there. So it's, it's, it's different. Um, it's not comparable at all, um, uh, even though we have to have concerns. So in the US, um, video visitation or the, 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 the video calls have been used very often to replace, um, not, to, uh, not to replace only the visitation during COVID times, but really uh, to replace physical uh, visitation because it's in some cases uh, it's more, um, uh, it works better in the advantage of the prison. Um, that visitors don't don't come in to, to to see their relatives. So, but that's something that we are not, uh, according to our European experience, that we are um, uh, that we are uh, experiencing here. So, yeah. So, I just wanted to make to make that uh, that point. Why, what I what I've been seeing as well is that in many jurisdictions, and as it was just uh, uh, presented uh, in in Czech Republic. Um, COVID brought a reflection around the use of technology in prisons that is really, it's very relevant, it's very important. And we've been seeing countries that would not allow uh, inmates to have more than five minutes phone calls or uh, either a day or a week, depending in, in many cases. Um, uh, I, very often I had the resistance that people would say, well, it's in the law, we cannot change it. And, and very often they didn't even remember why it was five minutes and not 10. Mm. Um, so it really, uh, the, the COVID reality really uh, uh, made people think about why do we do things on this way? And they say, well, yes, we do five minutes because actually we didn't have enough phones for everybody to call. So we, in order to avoid conflicts, yeah, we, we make it five minutes. But as Stephen said, uh, in Belgium, in France, in other jurisdictions as well, uh, now countries are moving into uh, in-cell in uh, phones. So having the phone inside, inside the cell so that the officers don't need to move inmates from one place to the other and they can call, uh, uh, they can call from their cell. So if the phone is in the, in the inside their cell, so why do we, do, re, do we restrict them to five or ten minutes? Mm -hmm. um, what is what is the, the argument there? So what yeah. I, just to, to go very briefly to say that, yes, I see that the COVID brought this uh, huge opportunity uh, to rethink and uh, the, the way we, um, uh, we, we uh, allow these basic uh, 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 services to be, to be provided. And I don't think it will go back. So I don't think that, and that's the major advantage of, of, of this situation, is that we'll continue to have video visitation, we'll continue to have uh, longer calls and more possibilities to call, uh, and, we will, um, and, and that will not replace the physical visitation, of course, the, the, the family visits, but it will be a very important uh, reinforcement to those, just, just to say that. Well, COVID makes us ask the question, why? And yeah. on, th on that note, we're going to move to th the last contribution on our agenda, which I said at the beginning was going to be busy, but busy good, I hope. And we're going to now uh, move to uh, Roman Safranek. Welcome, Roman. We've saved the best till last, Roman. Uh, so a warm welcome to you. Roman is uh, head of IT in, in the Czech Republic Prison Service. And I'm going to ask you to give a public perspective service perspective. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, John. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Roman, and I have prepared a short presentation for you uh, on the topic digitalization and human rights in prison. 
uh, year 2020, a year full of painfuls, uh, a very complicated year, year of the unknowns. Uh, this year uh, brought uh, many opportunities and challenges. The first challenges in uh, present service was uh, restrictions of uh, rights of the prisons. Uh, there was the prohibition of the family visit, uh, impossibility to work uh, for prisoners because the Czech Republic was locked down. Companies, fabric, every, uh, everything was stopped. Uh, there was uh, impossibility uh, of outdoor walks of prisoners because many, many uh, prisoners was in the quarantine. Uh, prison, the prison service of the Czech Republic applied uh, countermeasures and compensation for uh, prisoners. Uh, the main compensations were Video, video visit because uh, the contact with the family is very, very important. The video calls was very popular and very successful project. Uh, next project was uh, more calls, uh, more sport activities, uh, more interesting activities and e-learning, uh, e-learning on PC, internet and studies. Uh, I assume that uh, these uh, measures have been applied in the prison service around the world. Uh, but I must, I must ask, it was enough. I must answer that no, because suicide behavior has been the highest in the last 15 years in uh, prison, in prisons. Um, the pandemic situation hit the prisoners very hard. Uh, ICT is tool to eliminate this uh, pandemic uh, situation. Uh, year, uh, the year 2020 uh, brought many opportunities uh, for, for IT. Uh, on the spring of uh, 2020, uh, there was a uh, green light for IT projects, uh, how, to, uh, how to improve the prisoner's uh, conditions. Uh, I must uh, explain that the video calls will prepare uh, before pandemic time and uh, pilot uh, or the projects will take two years to implement to all uh, 35 prisons presence in the Czech Republic, but in the spring of 2020, we can deliver and start in 35 presence in two weeks only. Uh, next pilot is uh, kiosk uh, with self-service. Self we start this project in, in these days and there will, there, there will be a request from prisoners and uh, I don't know what else, <laughs> many think and uh, this uh, digitalization of uh, human rights uh, uh, inside the prisons. Uh, the, about these projects inside, we discuss uh, more than one year, but on the spring, uh, we meet only 30 minutes and we uh, made the final decision that we will start and implement this, uh, this uh, project. Uh, there are many next projects with uh, uh, probation and mediation uh, surveys uh, with NGO, uh, uh, non-government uh, organization. And uh, uh, now we start the uh, project Legal Knowledge for prisoners inside uh, prisons. Uh, but all the projects will and need uh, built a new IT infrastructure inside with very strong uh, safety, uh, security. Uh, this project will be very, very long, uh, for, for a long, long time. The, uh, I think that uh, years 2020 was very success, uh, very complicated, but success for, for IT and for uh, present service uh, with uh, new projects. Uh, 
board of prison service of the Czech Republic changed the mindset that uh, because the IT can help this uh, solve this problem, uh, this pandemic situation. And I think that um, uh, I, uh, I must say that uh, digitalization uh, with only add-on, uh, the humanity and the personal contact is very important for prisoners and IT is only add-on for, for this uh, for the situation. Uh, challenge challenge for the public sector uh, it's it stuff uh, i have problem with hire new developers uh, architects business analytics the problem is the salary problem is uh, the com competitive uh, with uh, private sector uh, for me the people is the this it stuff is hidden for me uh, and the money, money, money will be very interesting uh, for next year because IT projects need, 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 uh, need money. Uh, it is interesting that the prisoners gain experience with uh, digital self service, but uh, reality outside the public sector is different in Czech Republic because uh, paper still alive on the, our uh, public sector. Uh, and I, uh, and it is the crisis can will show how good is the information, uh, information systems and processes in the public sector. So now uh, we will cooperate with uh, many uh, another uh, ministries, uh, non-government organization on the projects. And I hope that uh, year 2021 will be so uh, successful too as previous years uh, with the IT project. I hope that, that they will uh, cooperate on the project with uh, this organization. And I would like to send uh, thanks to uh, present service in Slovak, uh, Belgium and England, because in previous year we can uh, visit this uh, country and inspire, inspire uh, in this country for uh, our project. So it's all. So it's all. Is that it? Thank you. Thank yeah, you very much. It's very short. So uh, uh, I have many times. All uh, right. No, well, that was very well communicated and emphasized, uh, and you ended by emphasizing international collaboration, but also the need to collaborate across ministries and with other agencies. So thank you for that. Now we've got um, about a quarter of an hour left and I want to stress that those of you on the live streaming uh, event, please feel free uh, to send in uh, more points. And I'm wanting to turn first to the round table for you to uh, reflect uh, uh, on what Roman has just said. And I want to pick up the challenge really about how hard it is to cooperate between agencies because quite often uh, sharing information is politically and organizationally difficult and one of our questioners um, said um, uh, about how hard it is um, that uh, people get very precious about their own information. And uh, perhaps you have experience of agencies collaborating. Uh, would anyone like to comment about that, please? 
Can I say something on that? Please, Steve. Yes, I, I was happy to 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 have have a delegation from Czech Republic. I think two years ago or last year in Belgium, and then. And I think your, with, with European support uh, and, and very important support from, from, from European international organizations like, like ICPA, for example, where, where I'm a board member, I think, I think we try to, see, to, 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 to help this, this, this journey of, of interagency inter collaboration. So, so I, I have the impression it's improving. Uh, I also have the impression that, that the, the, the digitalization is becoming more on the agenda of those international cooperation, which is, which is a good thing. And, and I really would, would like to, to, to uh, with all, all the audience we have, uh, um, uh, yeah, support them and, 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 and say that, please participate, please share and use those international organizations to do that. And, and then the conference like this uh, 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 to do that. Uh, so um, I think it's really powerful. And also what, 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 what Roman was mentioning, mentioning in, in, in the context of the collaboration, I knew from my experience as a CEO in Belgium, what's also very important are two things, is, is having uh, the collaboration internally within your uh, um, government, with, with the, 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 the courts, with the justice department, with the police, things like that. Uh, I, I, I acknowledge it's very difficult, but also on that, I think there are possibilities to, to, to do that and, and, and just take the initiative and, and, and talk with those people. And, and, and it's, it's possible because digital transformation is, is, is happening not in, in a single, on a single island. It's happening in an ecosystem of, of, of actors working together, NGOs, teachers, uh, Ministry of Justice, things like that. So, so we just have to have them all on board. So it's very important to, to, to work. And it potentially also helps to, to get the funding uh, better and 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 uh, the more people of every level are that are convinced that that it is needed, uh, the more more easier it will be to to get the funding and the budgets to to, to support. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had a, a, another comment coming from the audience about again stressing how many foreign prisoners there are in each jurisdiction, and how digital contact for those foreign prisoners is. Um, so I'd just like to emphasize that. Um, around the round table, would anybody like to indicate and uh, pick up any points that Stephen or Roman have made? If I may comment. Please do, um, Eva. Uh, my name is Eva. I work for the Prisoners Education Trust and we are a charity. And what we do is that we fund uh, learners in prisons in England and Wales in terms of the uh, distance learning courses. And as you can imagine, at the moment, everything is happening on paper uh, and it is quite difficult to source distance learning courses in today's climate uh, on paper. So we very much promote digitalization of prisons because it would be great if we could off offer digital courses where they could be done digitally and also perhaps assessments submitted uh, digitally. But I think that we are quite kind of far away from that. But what I wanted to say is that as Roman was talking about um, actually having the infrastructure of delivering digital in prison, that's kind of one aspect of it. But the, the other aspect is to be populating um, the kind of digital programs uh, with, uh, with something that is um, productive, that is useful, uh, that generally uh, prisoners uh, would find uh, kind of fun, rehabilitative, something that would kind of interest them. And it is something that at the moment Prisoners Education Trust is kind of exploring how we could work collaboratively with some prisons where the digital infrastructure might be there, but now people are seeking perhaps um, advice from other organizations, what to put uh, on those spaces um, and how to use them productively. Okay, thanks Eva. As you were talking, another comment came in about how important it is um, to use digitization to get materials in other languages. Um, myself, I use um, Google Translate a great deal, uh, but uh, that's again, perhaps another 
way that the digitization agenda can help. Uh, can I come back to the round table? Other, other comments, other people wanting to come in at this stage? I, I'm happy to do if, if <laughs> Stephen, uh, go. Sorry, because, but I, I have been involved a lot in, 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 in uh, educational context and project. And, and I had the same question from Luxembourg, from France, I think two weeks ago from Canada about content. Eh? So it's the, the platform of delivery, Roman, I think with, with, with open source software like Moodle and, and some basic equipment and an old service, you can do a lot to, 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 to make it available. But the content is very difficult, especially in international. So, so a, a project just just exchanging content or or, or just in, in, in open standards are, are there. Education is an open world. There are open standards just to copy content from from Romanian to to Belgium server to support Romanian prisoners in Belgium. It's not rocket science anymore. Mm -hmm. I, I I would say it's it's possible. We we have to work on that. Just just create a little WhatsApp group. With, with people and just start sharing on Google Docs some, some SCORM compatible educational content and, and, and you, you are started. Mm. Just to say it's, it doesn't have to be complicated, it doesn't have to be uh, expensive, it's just a matter of finding the right people to communicate and work together. Mm. Yeah. And um, I could. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, John. please do. Uh, yeah, just following on from, from Stephen's point, and I think. You know, I've I've been lucky enough to observe this this landscape um, for a few years now, and I've I've known Stephen for for very many years, and um, uh, th this issue of 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 both sharing resources and ideas and content um, has been, and as Stephen says, it, it is quite simple, and but I think you know events like these are sort of promoting there is a community of us out there that are w wanting to welcome you know people working in this landscape and and it's about developing this community and uh, for many years that community has been really small hasn't it Stephen is he there <laughs> yes it has been very small but luckily we see it yeah. It's getting bigger and bigger, and I think COVID is is, is is sort of you know shining a light, you know, finally, so certainly within the you know, and 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 throughout the last twelve months, I don't know about you, Stephen, but every day I get I get a request to talk to someone or find out a little bit more about something. So we need to grow this community, and we need to grow you know, an evidence base, including resources. And, um, you know, I'll put it to the audience out there today, could, you know, come and join that, that, you know, the, the, the sort of endeavor, because we need, we need lots of participants to engage in, 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 in this movement. Okay, right. We're coming towards the final few minutes. Um, so anybody on the round table hasn't said anything yet, I might be, be asking you uh, to, to say something. Uh, I've got a couple of outside points here um, from uh, Vivian uh, Guerin uh, from Ireland. Uh, he's saying that new technologies and artificial intelligence is on the Penological Council, that's from the Council of Europe's work plan agenda for the coming four-year period. So not only is the addition growing, but also the Council of Europe has got it on its four-year work plan. So that's, uh, I think, an important point to raise. Um, uh, someone called uh, Yiri Myrtle. Uh, one critical point to, to note about Skype calls, that there's some f uh, fear that there's a danger some Czech prisons will keep uh, sk Skype calls and not allow face-to-face -face visitation in the future. So, you know, a bit of a warning there. Now, uh, we are coming into the final few minutes because we are going to end on time. Um, uh, anybody want to add anything? Uh, Aidan or Lenka, would you like to make any points before we move on? I would like yeah. to answer to this question. Sorry. Uh, yes, there is a little pro there is a problem with the Skype. We will uh, working on the replace the solution to next cloud solution is a open source solution, and I hope that the second uh, quarter in twenty twenty one we will replace uh, this software to another. 
Okay, thank you, Roman. Aidan, do you have any comments? Yeah, please. Um, thanks, everyone. Um, sorry, I've been quite quiet so far. My name's Aidan. Uh, I work for a think tank called Reform, and we've written uh, several reports uh, on the prison system and recently on digital prisons. Um, I just, I know the point's already kind of been made several times, but I would like to reinforce what Stephen and, and, and Vic have both said about the need to kind of look outside of the countries we're in for ideas for how to move this agenda forwards. I mean, it's something that Stephen and I spoke about a couple of months ago about how several countries at the same time are trying to move the same agenda forwards and they can be doing it in a very siloed way. And I think this is also something from speaking to some uh, civil servants working on this in the UK. Uh, it's also something that can happen within departments when you have a moment like this where you're pushing this quite radical agenda forwards much faster than it has been in previous years. Um, on the one hand, there's the, the potential for kind of momentous change to happen quite quickly, but also in an emergency situation like COVID, you can get people getting quite tunnel visioned and kind of work continuing to work within the same silos and thinking, I do need to drive this agenda forward, but that's why I'm just going to narrow in and focus on it. And, and actually people get tunnel vision and they don't have these kinds of conversations with a wider group of people. Mm -hmm. um, I think in the UK, a really clear example of this would be the issue of trying to get prisoners on universal credit and trying to introduce a digital solution uh, for how you can get prisoners with access to digital terminals signing up to universal credit in the UK. Um, the collaboration is quite simple between the MOJ and the DWP, but you talk to civil servants in both and they're not necessarily having those conversations or they're finding it very difficult to work with each other. Um, and I think the same would be true of having these kind of international conversations mm -hmm. um, about where different people are at and what they're doing and how they can help each other move forwards. Um, so it was really encouraging to hear. Uh, I think I heard Roman say that he'd you know, been speaking to uh, the UK recently and, 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 and other people, and that's encouraging that those conversations are being had. Okay. Uh, Lenka, do you want to say anything before we finish? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to say that it was a very exciting time for me to listen to all these uh, presentations and discussion. And my main feeling is that it really, uh, it is really enough just to do small things and to discuss these small steps because I'm sure that this uh, digitalization is not just a matter of infrastructure, but it's also the matter of our uh, thinking and it really um, is uh, making our job different. So I would like to say that this discussion is also important and maybe next session might be about this topic. But thank you for <laughs> organizing it. <laughs> well, uh, we'll come on to what's happening next shortly. Um, everybody, we are running out of time. Now, I don't know about you, but it's always good that there's still energy in the room, as they say, even if the room is spread out over the internet and so uh, many different countries. I am going to just ask one or two people if they'd like to have a sign-off sentence, um, and then I'll, I'll wrap, up, wrap up. But shall we go to Jana first? Jana, if you'd like to unmute yourself and if you'd like to uh, just say something by way of conclusion. Yes, what I would like to say, let's really make the best of this opportunity that the COVID epidemic has actually brought to us and make the best out of it. But at the same time, let's be also aware of the big uh, differences and divisions also in, in the sense of access uh, to IT technologies when doing it. And I also think that still... Uh, the IT technology can never replace the personal contact. So, Thank you, Jana. Stephen, do you have a last word? Yes, and I think it's in the line with Jana just say, uh, I think technology uh, can things, as I already mentioned, make th bad things worse, but has a huge opportunity to, that make, can make it good things better. So, so we have to think about it. It's a journey. We, Digital transformation is not about translating existing analog processes into digital ones. It's about rethinking and asking, like Pospito was mentioning with a good example, asking why are we doing this and can we maybe do it better now we are just on the moment of reshaping and, and, and changing it. So that's my message. Be creative. Thank you, Stephen and Victoria. I'm going to be uh, quite playful and um, just regurgitate something that I've said several times before. Technology is not neutral. It brings about change. 
how we respond to that change is down to us. Um, so be ethical. <laughs> well, I will want to wrap up by saying thank you, first of all, to everybody who's done a presentation. Also, thank you to those of you who've been in the round table and for uh, sharing your thoughts and uh, comments. But I also want to thank you out there who's been in the audience for sending in comments and questions. Um, we don't know who you are, but uh, thank you for being there. And also, if you're listening on a podcast or dropping in on a YouTube, hope it's been useful. As INCJ, we are planning a future event which will be in many ways related to this. Our working title is uh, Cyber Working in the Post-COVID Probation World. And we're going to be doing this later in the year, and we've got uh, an American uh, presenter and somebody from Romania lined up. Uh, and I guess at a time when lockdown has given millions of people around the world an experience of what it's like to be locked up. Uh, we hope that you found this round table fascinating and useful. Technology is changing lives, and I think technology is changing prisons too. Thank you very much for being here today. And once again, uh, you can find us at any time uh, on our website or on Twitter. And this is signing off from the International Network Criminal Justice Seminar. Thank you. Stay safe wherever you are. Goodbye.